It's Igor Boa, Professor of Economics and Decision Sciences at HSA Paris and Professor at the Eitan Berglas School of Economics, Tel Aviv University. Thank you for joining us. What is your field of research? So I think I'd call it uh, axiomatic decision theory, uh, by which I mean uh, coming up with uh, decision models, uh, sometimes also for other problems like prediction or representation of uncertainty, uh, but trying to find some kind of general patterns and general ways to view them. What are the central questions that your field tackles? So the point, I think, mostly is to convince people. The reason we do axiomatics is to convince each other. I think that the main audience for uh, axiomatic decision theory are other scientists. Rarely it would be the case that you could directly talk to decision makers, and that's great when it happens, but I don't think that's the, the main thing. The kind of scientists that we talk to are basically two audiences. One is um, economists. So if you have an economist who's trying to understand a certain phenomenon, trying to make predictions, trying to give recommendations, they need these building blocks in their model, a model of how people make decisions. And then what we do is trying to provide such models and with the axioms try to convince them that one model may be a reasonable way to use in their own model as a descriptive model of how people behave. Whether they're, what they're doing is just describing or coming up with recommendations, they want a building block and say, how do people tend to make decisions? And the other audience is more decision scientists, to people who actually try and provide recommendations, talk to actual decision makers, and tell them, let's work together on your problem. They also need to some kind of a conceptual framework, and we're trying to talk to them and convince them that this or that conceptual framework is the right way for, to deal with this or that uncertainty. What are its most notable findings and results? in particular with respect to the issue of how uncertainty should be incorporated into decision-making. The uh, a crowning glory of the field is Savage's uh, theorem. So Leonard Savage in the 50s provided the foundations for expected utility maximization, saying, basically convincing the entire profession of economics, finance, political science, etc., that the rational way of making decisions is to behave as if you're maximizing the expectation of a utility function relative to a certain probability. The utility function is, of course, yours. Importantly, also the probability. So if you don't have objective probabilities, you should adopt some kind of subjective beliefs phrased in terms of probability. And the maximization of this basic formula, the integral basically, is the rational way of making decisions. It's convince the profession that this is what most people do and this is where the basic workhorse in economic models. He's also convinced the pro profession this is what people should do, so that that's the, the basic approach to how rational decisions are to be made. Is the expected utility account you described the standardly accepted approach in the field? What is your view on it? I think it's the vast majority view among economic theorists and decision theorists. Uh, so it's not the view of uh, that I would share, including some of my, you know, some of my uh, colleagues, more prominent than David Schmeidler, who's credited for I think having changed the, this this view to some degree or tried at least. So um, it's not an easy thing because of the power of these axioms and because of the um, really unbelievable beauty and elegance of Savage's result. I mean, you look at the axioms, and as I tell students, I can't believe that I've devoted 30 years of my life to violations of these axioms. But uh, you know, once you look at the conclusions, then at some point something looks wrong. In particular, you think that there is no way in this approach to say I don't know. So the approach basically tells you anything you do not know should be quantified probabilistically. And if you want to say, well, I don't have the foggiest idea, then it's not in language. I mean, the language is how much of a foggiest idea do you not have? And insisting on that at some point becomes a little bit counterintuitive. Some of the work that we've done is uh, to develop alternative models. Some of the work is also trying to delve into these axioms and say, how come after all uh, this has been said and done, we can argue that uh, it might be rational not to obey them. So there are lots of subtleties there about that. Um, I hope that there are more people who are willing to accept other models also as standard of rationality, not only as a description of how people behave.
but I do believe that for the time being, the vast majority of economic theorists would say that no matter what people do, the standard is this for rationality. What would you say to someone who subscribes to the standard approach to convince them to look elsewhere? I would just pose two questions that are sort of at the, at the meta level of uh, trying to explain why I find this thing uh, dubious. So the first one is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, if it's so rational, why isn't it objective? So the idea of the Bayesian approach is that in the absence of statistical data and statistical analysis that comes up with a well-defined probability, you're still picking your own number. And suppose that your number is 0.4 and number, my number is 0.6. And now suppose we even discuss that. And I'm trying to convince you it's 0.6 and you're trying to convince me it's 0.4. And we don't manage to convince each other. It remains subjective. We go each our own way. And then on my way back, I should ask myself, why couldn't I convince him? He looked like a pretty smart guy. Why couldn't I? And maybe he has a point in thinking it's 0.4. Maybe I should also allow for this 0.4 in my set of possibilities. So the distinction between rationality and objectivity is a little bit bothersome. Again, you, one can get into a different notions of rationality that we try to distinguish between. But um, very uh, succinctly, I would just say, if I couldn't convince him, what was wrong? Maybe I can't also convince myself. The other thing is just to come up with some silly examples that uh, try to explain to people what exactly do they buy, quote unquote, when they buy the savage axioms. So um, my favorite example is to come up with two words that uh, you've never heard of, let's say arbodites and cyclophines, and I ask you what's the probability that all the arbodites are cyclophines. And the point is that you have the foggiest idea, but you, don't, you cannot say I don't have the foggiest idea. That's not in your language. So some of my colleagues on which I tried it suggested, okay, I don't have an idea, let's say 50-50. Going back to La Laplace, Carnap, and but then it's easy to make this inconsistent. So if that's 50-50, how about uh, cyclophines being arbodites? How about them being disjoint? Not everything can be 50-50. And there are lots of examples of how this quote-unquote uniform or uh, principle of uh, indifference doesn't quite work in general problems. And importantly, these are problems where these things matter. If we talk about financial crisis, we talk about wars, we talk about global war war uh, warming. Uh, these things can, can have an effect on your policy and on decisions where you know, life and death and might depend on. So overall, I would say that um, I'm very troubled to think that uh, some policymakers, like government officials, would uh, make decisions that would affect the, the future of my children based on some kind of an arbitrary prior just because they read Savage and they were impressed by the beauty and they decided to pick up a number at random and determine the future uh, of my kids based on that. Suppose that you are asked for general practical advice on high stakes radical uncertainty decisions. What are the most important messages you would want to get across? Well, I think that uh, the past few decades uh, have witnessed the development of a couple of uh, models that are richer than the, the Bayesian one that is mostly supported by Savage's work and that we have uh, a richer language today. A bunch of models that <coughs> allow you to say, I do not know uh, much more than does the, the Bayesian one. And I would like the uh, policymakers to be conversing in this model. Now, I don't assume that they actually do it themselves. I assume that my audience are the decision scientists who, in turn, discuss these matters with the policymakers. I try to convince these decision scientists that they should adopt models that allow the decision makers to say, I do not know, when they don't know. So under the title of Night and Uncertainty and Ambiguity, we have a collection of models that uh, are out there uh, offered for decision scientists to, to use, depending on the need. It's not that I know that one model is necessarily the right one, but I think we should enrich the set of models that within which the discourse between the decision scientist and the decision maker is going to take place. So uh, I think there's one thing at the, uh, just the meta level of understanding what it is that we can do and what should be expected of us, is that um, the m there's more than one way in which decision m theory models can be useful. Uh, I think that the way that it was conceived of by the founding fathers in the 50s or so was more or less like a um, science or operations research where uh, we'll get the right models probably once and for all, 
will talk to the decision maker to get some data, like what are your preferences, what's your utility, so to speak, and then we'll give you the right answer. And there are cases that do that. Okay, so for instance, if you take some software like Google Maps that tells you how to get from point A to point B, that's a classical example. We have the algorithms, we know how to do it. There's no point in arguing. If you think you should turn right, the software tells you turn left, turn left. They know better, they figured it out, the algorithm is there. There's no real room for intuition once it's sorted out. But unfortunately, there are so many decisions that are not of this type. So if you think about where to put your money or uh, how to decide on your foreign policy or uh, whom to marry or stuff like that, I don't think anyone would pretend to say that decision theory or decision sciences have the answer to that. At the same time, I think it will be wrong to assume that they have nothing to say. I think it will be it's sort of a common mistake to say, oh, this is not easily quantifiable and therefore there's nothing for me to learn from that. Because the other way in which decision theory models can be helpful is in trying to test your intuition and to test the logic, the coherence, and so on. So imagine that you have a certain decision, whether it's your foreign policy or global warming or getting married or whatever. And you talk to a decision uh, theorist and, okay, the decision is there, but you s they say to you, let's try to test it. Let's try to see and put on paper what it is that you're trying to get. What are your goals? What are your beliefs that would justify what you want to get? Now, this depends on the model you choose. I mean, you may have a, a standard model, such as expected utility. You might think it's a little bit too restrictive for you. So there is also a meta dialogue about which model to get in place. But once we agree on the model, we can say, let's try to see what should factor into your utility function. How much weight do you put on A, B, and C? Let's see what kind of beliefs are needed in order to justify this kind of a decision. And then if it's very simple and the decision theorist gives you the model and you say, that's great, then you're very happy. And if you see that they work harder and harder and they come up with all kinds of models that look a little bit ludicrous for you and all kinds of weird utility functions, you might not like your own decision. That might be a reason for you to change your decision. So overall, I'd say that uh, there is a whole gamut of um, discourse between the decision maker and the decision theorist or decision scientist where with the uh, Google Maps example, you just explain your problem to the decision scientist, you get back the answer, that's it. In the other extreme, you have a certain decision that you're about to make and you want to test is, its coherence. In between, there can be a lot of back and forth, a kind of a dialogue. Uh, I think when we judge decision theoretic models, it's important to keep that in mind that there's more than one way of using them and not always will they fit the operations research standard of relegating the decision to the software, often it will be a matter of a dialogue, sometimes just a matter of testing your own consistency. How would this be applied to a radical uncertainty decision, such as climate policy? So I would start the discussion by asking, again, between the decision maker and the decision scientist, what class of models are we looking at? Are we, do we want to commit here to something like um, the Savagian expected utility model? Or is it the case that we might face more uncertainty and we want something that allows you to say, I do not know? Is it the case that we don't have the foggiest idea of how to look at it and we're just using something much more rudimentary without all scenarios, the states that we talk about? Once you have some kind of a discussion of this nature, with some examples of the basic principles of the axioms, etc., and you agree on the class of models, then you could start thinking about the entities therein, utility probability, sets of probabilities, analogies, general rules, the kind of things that feed into the decision-making process. What are the central challenges for the development of a proper account of how uncertainty should be incorporated into decision-making, appropriate for the sort of decisions we've been talking about? I'm afraid there's a huge challenge that remains, and this is where do we get the beliefs and um, how do we justify them? Uh, and maybe if we were to deal with this challenge, the previous one would not have been there. Um, the axiomatic approach, which is extremely pretty and very convincing and a very powerful rhetorical uh, device, doesn't tell you much about how to get these numbers. It tells you you should have, but then when you try to say, okay, which one should I choose, it mostly remains silent. Um, so I think what is sorely needed are models of belief formation, especially on the normative side, uh, 
quite naturally this would touch upon statistics, but I think that statistics is somewhat limited. Um, so, uh, but, th but the issue is, what is the right way to generate beliefs? I believe that if we had good answers to this, then as part and parcel we'll also get the scope of different models. So, if, for instance, if the, I take the standard Bayesian model and I have a certain method to generate probabilities that are good in the sense that they do reflect my beliefs, I would see what's needed. And when I don't have that information, I would see that the model doesn't work. So together with the correct beliefs that I would have, correct in the subjective sense, that I would have when I have them, I would also know where I do not, and then I should look for other methods. So I think that we don't have that, and the developments I mentioned uh, earlier also did not do um, much in this respect. Not much progress has, has been made, because it's still an axiomatic approach. It says, here's a black box. If it satisfies these conditions, it behaves as if, but doesn't tell you much about the building blocks inside. Now, uh, statistics and machine learning, of course, are terribly important fields and have wonderful results. Uh, still, I think that they are quite limited in being able to predict walls and uh, you know, decision makers' uh, personalities and things of that nature. So I think we have quite a bit of a lacuna there in terms of what are the right ways to generate these kind of beliefs. And um, to some extent, some of the work that David Schmeiler and I have been doing over the past decades is trying to make progress in this direction, but it's very rudimentary and I think that by and large the challenge is there. In your view, what are the top priorities and interesting directions for research, both in your field and for other fields, concerning these issues? If you look at uh, statistics and, and uh, machine learning, there is a relatively very uh, strong focus on asymptotic behavior, which is uh, where a lot of results lie. Uh, but in real life, we have a lot of things that needs to be done, need to be dec decided upon without waiting for the asymptotics. And uh, if we are talking about the probability of uh, war in uh, Eastern Europe uh, in the next uh, two years, um, the techniques of machine learning, you know, and, and uh, support vector machines and so on don't really apply. We don't have the same kind of repetitions that are in some sense under the same conditions uh, for which we could, we could use that. So, um, like in the, the case of global warming is in a sense slightly simpler conceptually because we know more about the physics. So even though the case we're facing is sort of unique, we have some building blocks that scientists know more about. But uh, overall there are many important cases where we just don't seem to have the, the basic equations, the flow equations as it were, of the, uh, the mechanism we are observing. In these kind of questions, I don't know that we have good methods of what is the right way to form beliefs. Taking into account that a lot of these things are going to be, I do not know, but still, to what extent do we not know? What are the partial things we do know? In, in this project I, I mentioned that David Schmeider and I and some colleagues uh, undertook, uh, we had this uh, uh, original uh, intuition or the original insight came from more or less psychological constraints, I would say. So the point is not necessarily to be fully descriptive, as in behavioral economics, but the idea was just say, even if we think about something normative, what could we possibly expect of human beings? So trying to see a little bit of how people think and try to delineate by this what are the boundaries of the most rational thing that you could sort of preach to them as a normative theory, how they should think better. Um, as a classical example, so it's pointless to tell them to play chess optimally, you know it's not going to happen, so ignoring these kind of constraints is, is, is going to be silly. So we went into how people think and started with very basic things such as case-based uh, reasoning and how this might feed into decisions. And basically it's uh, reasoning by analogies, learning from the past, in the simplest way, just like doing the simplest statistics of what is the mode of uh, the distribution and think it's the most likely thing to happen, great. Along the way, when we took an axiomatic approach to this, which is typically less the statistical approach, the statistics typically is more interested in asymptotics, uh, we came up with a couple of things that turned out to be things that statistics have been using for a while, in particular kernel methods, uh, sort of axiomatizing a couple of papers of ours without any intention of doing it, sort of popped up. At the same time, some formula that came out of the axiom uh, ended up being things that psychologists have been using. And I found it very exciting to see that 
uh, some models of how people think in a completely descriptive way that psychologists came up with, such as exemplary learning, are exactly the same mathematical formula as what some statisticians came up with, say kernel probabilities, in the, with the intention of coming up with the best possible way of fitting the data and making predictions uh, without any regard to how people actually think. Um, on the bright side, it can say that our brains are not so bad, that we could, uh, you know, the, the kind of thing that we naturally do is not so far from statistics. On the negative side, you could say that our statistics is limited to what's already inside our uh, circuitry, in some sense. But uh, I think there's a room for much more dialogue in, in this respect, and uh, to take more of the statistical techniques and try to see what of them can be um, complemented for cases where we have weighty decision to be made here and now before the asymptotics kick in and uh, try to still think reasonably about some questions that right now I don't think we have much to say about. This to me is one of the attempts to fill in the uh, belief formation process which also inter alia tells you where and when would you like this or the other form. So if you look at the database of something which is repeated in the same way over and over again and you take something as simple as um, confidence intervals and they shrink to a point that would be your probability, it's more or less objective, you go ahead. If it doesn't shrink to a point because the problem changes way too fast for you to accumulate data and you start saying that you need something else, or because you know that there are certain trends and you try to combine it with more sophisticated statistical techniques, um, you're going to get maybe also a bunch of models or at least some confidence level. So you could say, okay, given the kind of data I have so far, I would only have ranges of probabilities. Or you might say, look, the state space is going to be too large to even reason about. I can see that I can exhaust it or that writing it down would bring me anywhere and then maybe I should discard case uh, state-based uh, methods at all. So I think these things are, are intertwined. I mean, if we have a reasonable model of generating the beliefs, I think as a byproduct, we'll find out that this fits that model, doesn't fit the other one, maybe we should go to yet another model. I think that the, these answers would tend to come together.